Amen. Can you give it up for all those joining with us online for the very first time right now? Come on, give it up for them. Welcome. Hey, we're so glad that you're joining with us. And if it's your first time online with us, and if you're in the Dothan area, we would love for you to come and connect with us right here at Dothan First. There is no place like home, and there's nothing like being in the house of God. And uh, I want to give it up one more time for all those joining with us here in the building. Come on, first time guests, welcome. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. What a joy it is. And right after this service, Michelle and I would love to meet you, to greet you, connect with you for just a few moments. So if you don't mind uh, connecting with us out these doors and to your left in our guest reception, we won't take up a bunch of your time, but we just want to give you a gift for hanging out with us today. Well, go ahead, grab your copy of God's Word. Say this with me. Say, I am what God's Word says I am. I can do what God's Word said I can do. And I can become all that God said I could be. So today, I'll hear God's Word, I'll receive God's Word, and I'll obey God's Word because I love His Word. Now turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the college football season is just starting. There's plenty of time to catch up. If you had a team that didn't do what you thought or hoped that they would do, there's plenty of time. Everybody stay calm. Jesus is still on the throne. Okay. I feel like, I, I don't know, I'm in Alabama. I just have to start that way. I don't know why, but... Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, if you would. Hebrews chapter 12. We've been walking through this series on healthy habits, and specifically today, I want to talk to you about having healthy conflict resolution. Healthy conflict resolution. Hey, remember when you were a kid in school, in elementary school, and um, you got into an argument or a fight or a disagreement in school or on the playground or whatever, and you're at odds and you're scrapping or you're verbally jousting each other, and all of a sudden what happens? A teacher shows up or the, the monitor there on the playground shows up, and they intervene. They get in between you. They're the peacemaker, and of course they make you make up with that person whether you like it or not. Right? And, and as any good kid would, you stand there and you're not going to be the first one to shake hands, to put out your hand. You put out your hand first and I'll shake it if you put it out there. And then eventually the teacher says, now you say, I'm sorry. And you go, I'm sorry. And then, no, you're not supposed to say it the way. You say it the right way. And you shake hands and make up. And then sure enough, 5, 10, 20 minutes later, you're back out on the playground having a good time. Or you're back in class with that student. And the teacher was the peacemaker in the middle of your conflict. And I wish that that teacher or that monitor could be around in the, in the middle of adult conflict because people have lost their marriages, people have lost their families, people have lost their jobs because that teacher didn't show up in the middle. They thought we'd grow up and get a clue on how to deal with conflict. And I wish so often that we could have had one of those teachers or peacemakers in the middle of the conflicts that we often have as adults because if we had only kept our mouth closed, so much could have been avoided. So many regrets, so many lost relationships, some that literally have, haven't spoken in 20 years because of those last words that they spoke. Friends, I want to give you a biblical pathway to help you in conflict. Conflict is inevitable. It's like death and taxes. They're both inevitable, okay? So conflict is inevitable, but how you handle and manage that conflict makes all the difference in the world. And I know none of you woke up this morning with your, fin your, your fists clenched and your teeth clenched going, I can't wait to fight somebody today. But guaranteed, you're going to come across someone at some point that causes a little rift, a little ruffle in your feathers, and all of a sudden now there's conflict. You need to understand how do you manage it in a healthy way, in a healthy way. We all have emotional and relational conflicts with people, and, and I can just tell you one of the problems is that... Um, Every person in this room has at least one, if not dozens, of emotional and relational scars that go right back to a place of conflict in your life. All of us have it. 
And a scar is a, it's a reminder of a painful story, a painful chapter in the history of our lives. Now, how many of you have a, a scar? I, I've got a scar, a uh, physical scar. Um, and, and I can't say that I have a ton of them. Being in sports, though, especially playing soccer, uh, we were in a few years where they weren't requiring people to wear shin guards, these things that guard your shins, uh, these plastic guards. They, they weren't making us wear. And so we thought we would be cool if we didn't wear them. Kind of like, you know, we didn't wear helmets back then, and that's why we're all brain damaged a little today. But we, we didn't wear shin guards because we wanted to look cool and tough. And so all my shins on both sides, having guys slide in feet first with their cleats and just ride down my, my uh, shins. I, I, I have a lot of those ribbons scars <laughs> down my shins. But I have one scar in particular that I see every single day. It's right between my eyes. And no, I didn't have a fight with David and I'm not Goliath. But I can tell you there was a moment in time. I've never had a physical confrontation with my older sister accepting this one moment. I'm serious. I mean, my sister and I got along so well. We watched Sunday morning cartoons or Saturday morning cartoons together. We'd eat our pop tarts together, put butter on them. Come on, somebody. We'd watch our cartoons. We'd go ride bikes together. We had so much fun together. But my sister, one moment, one moment, and she got mad at me and she pushed me. And it was at a time where I was kind of stay. I was already leaning this direction. I was walking away, and 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 she pushed me, and I fell down and I hit my my head right here on the stereo system, the corner of the stereo system. And you know, when a child, you know, you can have like a, a scrape on your arm or on your leg and it's not so bad. But when you have like a little scrape on anywhere on your head, oh, it just, it just looks like there's, I mean, blood everywhere and it just looks so bad. And I, I turned around to get mad at my sister and all of a sudden I felt this blood pouring down. And she's like, ah! she starts crying and I didn't know if she was crying because I was hurt or because she was scared she was going to be in trouble you know what I'm talking come on anybody have siblings in the room you know and we all have these little scars and I get to see that one every single day of my life a little reminder that my sister's evil and I'm not I'm just kidding I, I love my sister I shout out to my sister in Detroit I love her but so many of us we have those relational or emotional scars or even physical ones where there was abuse somewhere at some point, and that those memory triggers that when we see the scar, we remember the pain. Even though we don't feel the pain, we still remember it deeply. Those memory triggers. You hear a song and you have a memory, or you, you, you're driving down the road and you see a sign, or you see something and, and it, it reminds you. Those memory triggers of past pain, and I wanna see those things today get healed. The conflict may be over, but the memory exists. And how we rehearse our memories is a big key to that healing process. God designed us to not have to carry conflict into our future. I don't want you to be buried in conflict. Jesus said it like this, I've come to give you life and, and that to the full. In, in other words, he doesn't want us to be dragged down by old wounds and old conflict. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 14. I want you to say these first three words out loud with me. You ready for this? These first three words of this verse, ready? Make every effort. Let's try it again. Make every effort. Turn to your neighbor and say, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. What does that mean to make every effort? It's, in other translations, it says to work at, to embrace, to pursue, to strive. How many of you want to live in peace? I'm not talking about how many of you like forgiving. I'm talking about you just like to live in peace. We want peace in our life. We don't want conflict. We want peace. How do you get there? How do you make every effort? I want to give you four things that you can remember. Four things that will trigger your memory so that when you get ready to go into a conflict, you'll have a healthy biblical pathway to get you through it and you can get to the other side of it. Okay, here, listen, friends, for some of you, this may be the most important four things you'll ever listen to as it relates to conflict in your whole life. It's not because I'm saying it, it's because it's biblical. So you can write these down, but here they are. The first one is this, remember. Everybody say, remember. Remember. 
remember to be more sensitive to others' needs than your own. Let me say that again. Remember to be more sensitive to others' needs than your own. Some of you are masters at sensing when something's wrong in the room, right? A look or a word or a missing word or a tone, and all of a sudden, you know, bing, that's conflict. I, I know that. My, my wife is what, what we would call a feeler. She feels things that are, that are in the room. She senses things. And so she immediately knows when there's conflict in the room, even if it's unspoken, she can just feel it. She's a feeler. How many of you feelers in the room? You know what I'm talking about. You just know. And then there's others of us. God bless you. You have to be told that there's conflict in the room, right? You have to be told you are in conflict. Your spouse has to tell you, by the way, we are in conflict. And you're just like an emotional zombie. Like, yeah, I guess I am in conflict. I don't know. I don't know what happens to us. But for the, there's just some of us that, I, I don't know, we, we just don't have that sense about us. We're just not as sensitive. We're a little clueless. I mean, we're the type of people that if somebody flips us off, we go, oh, those are nice nails. I like that. That's nice. That's nice. You got your nails painted. That's nice. I like that. Have no clue that there's conflict in the room. Also, I think it'd be smart if we identify those default conflict management recognitions, the reactions that we have. Each one of us has a different reaction when conflict comes. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of them that are pretty universal. The first one is this. When you have conflict, when conflict hits you, you get angry. You boil over, right? You're ticked. It may be verbal or nonverbal anger, but there's a short fuse. It's a short wick on a huge explosion. The veins pop. You're mad. You're ticked. You're frustrated. Everybody knows it. And when you walk through the conflict, you boil over. When you're hurt, you get mad. Now, I'm going to ask you, there's, there's three more, but I'm going to ask you to identify by a show of hands, just being honest, if this is your typical default conflict management reaction, I want you to be a little honest, okay? And by a show of hands, how many of you would say, that, that's right, I, I know that there may be some of you in this room, you may have to have your spouse hit you like this to tell you that is your default conflict management reaction. All right, so by a show of hands, how many of you would say, when conflict hits, you get angry. Angry. Come on, put up your hands. Okay, yeah, we got some honest people in the room. All right, I got my hand up too, all right. All right, so the next one is, when conflict hits, you get silent. <laughs> people are already raising their hands. I didn't even ask for it. You just, boom. You're silently raising your hand. That's good. You basically, you stew over things, right? You back off, you withdraw, you retreat, but you think about it over and over again. It's on replay, baby. It is on replay. It's like a skipping record for those of you that know what old school, anybody old school in the house, you know what a record is? Okay, they skip or a CD. Anybody know what a CD is? Old school people in the house, those are little tiny, smaller discs that they, kids, it's a tiny disc and it, it plays music. <laughs> you, that thing's on repeat, baby. You stew about it over and over again. And then as you're pouting, somebody asks you, hey, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> while your arms are crossed <laughs> you're staring off into space everybody else is having a great time and you're just sitting there scowl on your face what's wrong nothing i'm fine <laughs> if your spouse ever says nothing and you can see on their face that it's not nothing just get down on one knee and say hey listen sweetie i i just want you to know that i love you with all my heart and whatever i've done i just want to take the time whatever you've done you mean you don't know what you've done? <laughs> Show of hands one more time for that one. You're silent. You get a little silent. Come on. Okay. All right. The next one. When conflict hits, you ignore it. Right? What tension? You are so insensitive and oblivious. <laughs> You're just walking around, looking around, right? Like you deny what's happening. It's ignorance is bliss for you. Show of hands, anybody in the room? Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Honesty in the room, I like this. How about this last one? Here's another universal one. When conflict hits, you pretend. 
You pretend like it's no big deal. It doesn't affect me. Nothing affects me. I am too cool for school. I am so strong and so capable. You can't hurt me because I won't let you in. I'm not going to let you get close enough to hurt me. It didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. And you're smiling all the while. And in your mind, you are, you, you've are you got this karate move that if they just turn their back, you're like, <laughs> like you're ready to take them out. It's the, the, the pseudo-typical passive-aggressive. You're so mad, but you smile on the outside, but you're ready to stab them in the back with revenge. Come on, if that's you, come on, put up your hands, okay? All right. it, you know what, by the way, it's not only good that you recognize your own pattern, it's also good that your spouse sees you, if your spouse is in the room, or the, your boyfriend or girlfriend, they see what conflict management style, that way they can know what to look for in you. That's really helpful for you to be first a self-identifier and then have help from somebody else who can tell you what you are. That's not bad. By the way, if you raise your hand for two of those, that, there's a clinical term for that. It's called sick. It, you're sick, okay? You need help. And, and you know what? If you didn't raise your hand at all, for all four of them, you know what that, that's called denial, okay? And, and your spouse or your family members need to really help you become a better identifier of those things because we all have them. We all have them. And I want you to take an action step on that first remembrance is that we've got to commit to be more sensitive to others than to ourselves. We're internally sensitive about ourselves. We're rarely sensitive toward others. Second thing to remember very quickly is remember. Everybody say remember. Second thing is that we remember that we live in a fallen and broken world. We're all broken, man. I don't like to say it, but conflict happens because we have a free will to choose. God gave you a free will to choose, and sometimes you choose to hurt others. With 8 billion people on the planet all having the free will to choose to be selfish and self-centered and self-motivated, eventually we end up hurting people along the way because we're selfish by nature. Or others hurt us because of their selfish decisions or their sinful choices. Romans 3, 23, for everyone has sinned. Everybody say everyone. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And because of that theological foundation that we just read, you need to understand that God is not shocked by conflict. He's not shocked by global conflict that has happened for thousands of years B.C. and thousands of years A.D. after, uh, after the, the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord. There's been global conflict since the beginning of time. But there's also personal conflict, and, and God is not moved off of his throne simply because someone hurt you. He's waiting for you, listen, on the other side of that hurt to turn to him. This thing has been going on from the beginning. There's this two people, the first two people that are mentioned that were created. These are God's creation, the first two, Adam and Eve. Check this out. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. And before too long, one son murders, not punches, not like gives him a Wah! throat punch. You know, and it was literally murdered his own brother. We're only four people into humanity, and we're doing great already with conflict management. And what's worse yet is it was all over worship and vegetables. Read it. I'm telling you. This is, this is how crazy things had already gotten four people in to creation. Other people choose to hurt us. We hurt other people because we choose to because we're broken. Let's go to the next one. Number three is remember. Everybody say remember. Remember to make every effort to seek peace with others. To seek peace. We gotta seek peace. We gotta seek it out. Right? You don't want to permanently damage your life and your relationships and ruin your life over conflict that is unmanaged. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, do all that you can. Everybody say those words with me. Do all that you can to live at peace with everybody. You have to pause and say, I want to be in peace 
inside myself. I want to be at peace with God so that I can be at peace with others. It's so important. Do all you can. Ask yourself, what was my part in the conflict? Listen, this is my least favorite part, is identifying not only my pain, but my stupidity. Here it is, Psalm 4, 4. Look at this. It says, don't sin by letting anger control you. It doesn't mean that anger is never going to darken your doorstep. It just means don't let it control you. Well, how do you do that? How do you keep from having that thing just overtake you? Well, it goes on to say, think about it overnight and remain silent about it. I'm not talking about giving them the silent treatment. I'm talking about before you shout about your anger and letting it overtake you where your anger goes from your mind to your heart to your mouth. You stop in between. You go, no, I'm going to take this to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to think about it. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to that person the way God sees them. Think about that. Remain silent. Searching your heart. Listen, that's the only way to get to the root of your hurts. You need to ask yourself, where did that come from? You know, sometimes we have triggers and we go off and it wasn't even that person's fault. It was a filter that we've had that may go all the way back to childhood and it triggered a memory that we didn't even recognize it. It was subconscious, but it hit us in a way that really hurt us and we remembered an old wound and it just reopened that thing all over again. Rejection can, that goes all the way back to childhood, an, an old wound. We've got to identify our hurts. Listen, if you went to the doctor today and said, doctor, I hurt somewhere. And they go, well, where do you hurt? And you say, I'm not going to tell you. They can't help you, friend. Sometimes you've got to recognize it's not what they said or what they did. You have an issue of insecurity or brokenness or something that hit a nerve have you ever touched someone's skin that was sunburned? Look, it's one, you, can, you can pop somebody on the arm and it doesn't hurt at all. You barely touch somebody that's got sunburn and they want to punch you in the throat. Come on, somebody. Right? Why? Because it's more sensitive and oftentimes the conflict comes because you hit a sensitive spot that has never been healed. It's a hurt that hasn't been healed. I've told many of you this story, but I'll rehearse it. My most embarrassing story, all right? I'm going to give you one of my most embarrassing. I got a ton of them. Matter of fact, when an embarrassing time comes, I just write it down because I know it's going to be great sermon material in the future. I'm just saying. But my most embarrassing moment in my lifetime, and many of you might remember this, some of you may not, but I was a freshman in high school. And we had a pep rally, and I was on the basketball team, and I'd been moved up. So I was what I thought was one of the big dogs. And if you know anything about high school basketball in particular, is they have something called hazing of the younger players. If, you've, if you didn't know this, this is kind of what happens, is they find a way to get you. All right, it's just, it's just the way that it is. And so I was a freshman, we're at the pep rally, the whole school is there, the stands are full, the cheerleaders have done their thing, and now in the middle of this cheer, they stop and they say, we're gonna see which class, the freshman, the sophomore, the junior, or the senior class, has the most spirit in the school. Come on, anybody ever been there? Okay, three of you, good. All right, um, this may be harder to explain than I thought. None of you had a pep rally? Come on, somebody. All right. So they're going to pick somebody from the basketball team, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, for a pie-eating contest. All right, so they, they get, they, I, I have the most school spirit. That's what I said. I wish that I had not said that I had the most school spirit, but I said it. So I raised my hand. They picked me, and they picked a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. They brought us back away from the rest of the audience. And I, I honestly, I... I You'd think as a freshman I would have gotten a clue like, hey, something, why would they take us away from the pies were right there? Why did they take us away? Well, what they said was they're going to blindfold us. So they blindfold all of us and they're walking us. Out. They, Can you see anything? No, I can't see anything. And the cheerleaders lead 
Each one of us out blindfolded. We got to have our arms behind our back and we're going to have a pie eating contest. All right, so I get in there and I hate the pie that they happened to have had. It was peach. I'll never forget this as long as I, it was the worst tasting in these big old chunks of peaches and I could not hardly swallow. I'm gagging on this, but I have school spirit and I will represent the freshman class because I've gotten bumped up to the team. Yeah. Whipped cream on my face and the pie all over my face. And all of a sudden, they announce the winner, and it's me. It's me. I've got school spirit. I was the one gagging on those chunks of peaches. That's me. I mean, the freshman class should be proud that I was the one that had the most school spirit. We're going to win the spirit stick. And I don't know what that spirit stick was, but it's the stupidest thing in the whole wide world. And I knew I had just won. And so they put my hand up, but my blindfold's still on. And I take off my blindfold. And what I realize is that I'm the only one in the entire school. There's no one else eating pie but me. And there's no one else blindfolded but me. And the entire school is laughing at me. Yeah, now you think that's very funny, and <laughs> I like you now. No, it's, see, today I can talk about it openly, but then as a, you know, insecure freshman, it was the most devastating thing. The teachers laughing at me, the basketball team laughing, the cheerleaders laughing at me. I wanted a date. Come on, somebody. I, I wanted to have a prom date. Who's going to date the kid who's stupid enough to eat the pie all by himself in front of the whole school? It was the most embarrassing moment in my life. And yet, listen, there are times where you may be the one picked out. You didn't do anything wrong. You were the innocent victim in it, but you just happened to be the one picked in the moment. It's going to happen, folks. And at some point in the journey, you have to just let it go. Say, God, you know what? I, I love those people in my life enough to not take myself so seriously. And, and, and you get past it. Now, I haven't. And any teacher that's watching right now, I want you to know, you're at fault. No, I'm just kidding. I, got, I gave that up a long time. I promise. I gave that up a long time ago. That's why I can tell the story today and laugh about it. Some of you were innocent victims, and it may not have been a prank, but you were innocent victims in the crossfire of you just happened to be the one who got picked. And I hate that, and I'm sorry for you. I know what the embarrassment feels like to some degree, certainly publicly, but I want you to know God is with you in your hurt. You're not alone. He stands beside you. But some of these conflicts aren't so one-sided. Other moments, it was two-sided. You played a part as well. And I want you to think about that. What was, I want you to ask yourself right now, what was my part? What did I do? What did I not do? What was my role? What did I say? What tone did I give? What look did I give? And we can move swiftly past what we felt in the moment and go to the blame game and just start blaming them. It's so easy to do that. But the action areas, the action steps we've got to identify is what was my part, right? I yelled or I got angry or my tone was off. I did something or I didn't do something that I should have done. And then we have to go deeper. Turn to your neighbor and say, go deeper. So now you've gotten past the part that you have to take responsibility for. But I think the deeper part, after you know, we've gotten through the, the simple and simplistic and superficial, these are the actions that I took that were wrong. But how about this? Go after your motive. What was your motive in it? What was the deeper motive? We're complex people and we rarely have pure motives, friends. I want you to think about it. We live a life filled with mixed motives and God cares deeply about your motives. Proverbs 16 2 says it like this. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord, what? examines what? Examines the motives. How do you examine your motives? It takes time. It takes reflection. It takes brutal honesty. Sometimes it takes a counselor or it takes somebody that's a close enough friend to be honest with you or a spouse that'll be honest with you. 
And you got to ask the tough questions. What am I not seeing in myself? What's the tough stuff that I, I need to work on? And that requires a lot of reflection to get after that motive. It's hard work, but it can get done with God's help and with a little humility. And that leads us to the fourth thing, which is remember. Everybody say remember. Remember, remember all those others who will be affected by your conflict if you don't get past it. I want you to think about this. When conflict bombs explode, shrapnel flies all over the place and hits people, it causes collateral damage. Listen, if I'm having, when, when we were young, married, and we had small children, if I was having a conflict with my spouse, which I never have because Michelle and I get along on every decision, we are just type B, laid back personality types where another, neither one of us has to win anything ever if you don't know us, we're both type A personalities. We absolutely adore the, the not, not conflict, but we love, both of us love to win. She was a, a softball player growing up all those years. I love to play sports. We both were taught and trained to win at all costs. And early on in our marriage, that was not a healthy situation. And so neither one of us were passive. But now all of a sudden we've got one child and then a second child and now a third child. Guess what? If we have conflict, even those children then become innocent victims where they can have what they feel, fear, creating fear inside of them because of the conflict and the collateral damage of the conflict. That's, there's a time where we've had to many times in our younger years have to go to our small children after we have maybe a few words and then we'd be smart enough, hopefully, to get away from the kids for a few minutes to talk things out and work things out. And then we'd come back to the kids and say, hey, I just want you to let you know, first of all, mommy and daddy, we may have raised our voices a little bit. We apologize for that. I want you to know I love mommy. Mommy loves me. We're doing fine. We love each other. We're a happy family. But I want you to know sometimes conflict comes and here's how we resolved it. As our kids got older, we didn't include them in marital conflict, but at times if they overheard certain things, we would tell them how we resolved it. Because one day they're going to be married and have families and they need to figure out how to deal all, with all this feelings and emotions that come up. This domino effect. Tension has a domino effect. It affects everybody. I'm going to tell you a very quick story. I was uh, on a flight this week flying out of Atlanta on Delta Airlines, and everyone that talked to me that found out that I was on a Delta flight going out of Atlanta said, did you hear about the story? Did you hear about the story? You flew out of Atlanta on Delta this week? Are you kidding me? You flew Delta this week out of Atlanta? Surely you heard that. You weren't on the plane, were you? That, that situation that happened where they had to turn around and come back? And they, 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 you, I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, you can look it up because I'm not going to give you the gross and gory details. But what I will say is that they had to turn around in the middle of a flight, fly back to Atlanta because the pilot said they had a human biohazard issue because someone could not control their bowels. I cannot fathom in my wildest imagination having to be that person that is forever known as the person who couldn't hold it on a plane. <laughs> they had a bathroom issue and they had to literally fly back. Yes, fly back. And then they had to completely take out the carpeting out of that entire plane. Yeah, I know. I didn't even want to have to tell you this, but because I used to be a junior high youth pastor, I could not pass that up to tell you about this story. But let me explain to you why I think that is significant. First of all, it's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I just flew out of Delta from Atlanta, and I'm glad I wasn't on that plane, and it wasn't me. I'm just saying. But what I will say is this. Everyone on that plane was affected by someone who couldn't hold it in. <laughs> and so it is with your conflict. Everybody else is affected. Everybody. Your family, your friends, your coworkers. Here's what happens. You go home. You have a conflict at work. That conflict just carries right over to your spouse. You get mad at the spouse. The spouse get mad, gets mad at the kid. The son gets mad at the, 
the, the daughter, the daughter gets mad at the dog, the dog bites the cat, and this is the house the conflict built. All because you couldn't hold it in. You were aggressive in, in the nature, your sin nature of frustration and anger. You could not hold back. There's a lot of people in your life that are going to be affected by your conflict. Matter of fact, we try to get people in on our conflict. We'll tell people on social media, get on my side. Here's what they did to me. And then now you want to tell them all about your conflict so that you can get them, them on your side rather than using the Matthew 18 principle that says, go to that person and get things right. Get it right. Adjust your own attitude and get things right. Philippians 2, 3 says it like this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Here, I want all of you to read this next portion aloud, starting with be humble. Everybody together, you ready? Be humble, thinking of others as what? Better than yourselves. That's tough to do. God's teaching us about conflict management. You want to be first? Be last. You want to be greatest, be least. You want to be the best, put others first. This is God's teaching. And typically we live in two, one of two camps. Either we want to be liked or we want to be right in conflict. And neither one gives us the biblical process. Whenever you're trying to honor God in the biblical way, I want you to know, listen, it's not going to be the easy way. The easy way is to stew, to boil, to hold on to something or to release it all over everybody. That's the natural inclination of human beings to be selfish and self-centered, but the biblical way is not going to be easy to make every effort. Now listen, sometimes conflict requires confrontation, and some people run from confrontation because they feel like confrontation, they have in their mind what that is, is it's combat and it's domination, but that's not what that is. Matter of fact, a conversation can be confrontation when it's done with a gentle and humble spirit. And let the confrontation be face-to-face, -face, not text. Come on, somebody, where they can't even read your body language or email. You know, send, and you shouldn't have hit that send button. You should have deleted that whole email. The Apostle Paul was confronting his friend and fellow follower of Jesus Christ uh, named Peter. It says it like this. Uh, Peter and Paul were in a disagreement in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, Paul said, I opposed him, look at this, to his face, because he was clearly wrong. You got to identify, there's an issue, here's what hurt me, but then listen, now you have to go to the most important part of a confrontation to say, and here was my part, here's what I did wrong. Acknowledging that is where the shift happens. See, most confrontations turn into battles because of defensiveness, they, you just tell them what they did wrong. You're not taking any responsibility. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, Jesus said, Why do you notice the little piece of, piece of dust in your friend's eye and you don't notice the big piece of wood in your own eye? Some of you are looking through life just like this. Man, you had a plank sticking out of your eye and you're banging people around every time you turn and you're telling them, Hey, I think you, I see some sawdust in your eye. I, I see some sawdust there. And you, boom, you turn around, you hit somebody else. I think I see some sawdust there. They're like, dude, you got a plank in your eye. What's your problem, man? You can't even see out of one eye. Friends, how many of you in this room haven't taken the time? The reason your conflict and your confrontation is not working is because you're doing this. You know when they say you can't see the forest for the, <laughs> the trees? You're never able to get through conflict when you got a log sticking out of your own eye, when you don't take responsibility for what you've done in the matter. And all of us have impure motives. So somewhere along the journey, we got to recognize, I made some mistakes. Admit them. Deal with yourself first. If you don't, that's called hypocrisy. The most, and then the most important thing you need to do is be willing to apologize. Friends, we are experts as parents about telling our kids how to say sorry. Say you're sorry to your sister. You just hit her upside the head. Tell her you're sorry. Now you better tell her, I'm sorry. No, that's not the way to say it. You got to say it nice. I'm sorry. No, now that was a little sarcastic. You need to say it nice. I'm sorry. Okay, now you can, you, you can play together again. Friends, apologies cost us nothing except for our pride and our ego. Cost you nothing. 
but you can't humble yourself. It's that certain age we get to, we just don't want to apologize anymore. And if the worship team would come as we prepare to close, friends, you won't get God's favor and blessing on your life if you're a prideful person. How many of you, if I was sitting across from you at a table, just kind of, you know, you were sipping on coffee or having a meal with me, and I said, do you want God's blessing in your life? I don't think anybody in the room would be so silly to not say, yes, I definitely want God's blessing in my life. Well, if you want God's blessing, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says it like this, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility. Everybody say humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 29, 23 says it like this, pride ends in humiliation while humility, everybody say humility, brings honor. Prideful people are spiritually immature. Prideful people are spiritually immature. You want to grow spiritually. God wants to work on your pride to make it easier for you to learn how to apologize. And God is helping to kill your pride to be more like him. Because the Bible says God hates pride. So conflict may require confrontation. It may require an apology. But it always requires you to walk in a spirit of forgiveness. The problem is most people's scars haven't healed. They've never given them over to the Lord. And like a scab that's being picked at all the time, that wound keeps opening and reopening and reopening and reopening. Friends, it's time to be able to turn this over to God. You say, well, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Friends, you're holding the key to a prison cell. You're like, yeah, that's right. I'm holding them in a prison. No, you're holding the key to the prison that is, you are, you are in that prison holding on to the key. That person has long forgotten how they hurt you, but you've got the key that unlocks the door to your own prison cell to set yourself free before God. You've got to learn to forgive. Jesus' followers asked him about forgiveness. He said in Matthew 18, I alluded to it earlier, but verses 21 and 22, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should we forgive? How often when somebody sins against us and and he thought he was going to be smart because the teaching of that day is that those that were wise and those that were humble forgave up to three times. And he said this, he went went a step further. He's like, I'm going to do it times two. I'm going to do three times two and I'm going to get six and then I'm going to add one to it because Jesus will really think I'm humble. He said, up to seven times? Jesus said, no. Not seven times, 70 times seven. Friends, this is how Jesus chose to forgive. When he was on this cross, his arms were stretched out wide. Those that were spitting on him, those that had put a a, a crown of thorns on his head, those that put nails through his hands, through his feet, that when he was completely innocent of everything that they had accused him of, he put his arms stretched out. He said, I love you this much. And he looked past time and eternity and he looked to you and the sins that you would commit and he would say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Friends, do you think that they deserved it? No, they didn't even ask for Jesus' forgiveness. But he gave it willfully out of his love. Because here's what happens when we don't forgive. A piece of your soul called joy dries up and a root of bitterness springs up. The light of God's spirit is quenched by the darkness of your unforgiveness. Some of you have a root of bitterness inside of you that has to be healed. It's got to get healed. You don't have enough time in your lifetime to waste on that root of bitterness that's like a cancer eating you up from the inside out. You don't have time for that, friends. Your body wasn't made to carry it. It's time for you to let go and release some things to God. You need that scar finally healed. And you may be only one act of forgiveness away It's not weakness to forgive. It takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of courage. 
but it's where healing begins. The wounds are most hurtful by those who are closest to us, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your extended family, and mostly in the house of God. Some of you in this room, you've been hurt by people in church and you'd love to take this two by four. <laughs> Come on, anybody that played baseball, you know you want to get a good swing, man. Get that leg up and really power through. Right? And you know what? Maybe they deserved it. Maybe that leader that hurt you, maybe that pastor that wounded you or that church member that hurt you, maybe they did deserve a, a, a two by four upside the head. Maybe they, they, they were that ugly. They didn't represent Christ at all. They did it wrong. How many of you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, his glorious standard. So what do we do? We take that two by four and we crucify our own sinful nature. And we say, listen, just like Jesus did in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but what? But yours be done. It's time to release forgiveness today. It's time to set yourself free. It's time to let God free you. Would you bow your heads with me for this moment? Lord Jesus, in this room, there are many who are hurting, who are broken, who've walked through pain and crisis. And Lord, their hearts are hurting and they've allowed bitterness to capture them. But God, I pray today would be a new day, a fresh day of healing the healing of hidden hurts that have been carried for so many years, some that go all the way back to childhood, Lord Jesus, today. By your Holy Spirit, would you just begin to tap people on the shoulder, wrap your arms of love around them and let them know you're right beside them, that you care about them and that you don't want them to carry this hurt further. I come against the enemy that's come to kill, steal, and to destroy and the pride and the ego that would keep us from releasing God, your forgiveness and your healing. And to me, more like Christ means taking up our cross and following you, which means dying to ourself, our selfish na nature, our selfish will, what we want, what we think, what we feel, and being mature spiritually by allowing you to do the healing work. Now I pray for the restoration of relationships right now. Bring healing up throughout this house in Jesus' name. Those watching online, I speak right now over you that God will bring healing as you submit to his will. As you humble yourself, call upon his name. Right now, begin to do that. If you've been hurt, if you've been broken, I just want you to begin to cry out to the Lord in your own way, your own word. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for carrying this bitter wound in my spirit for so long. Begin to ask him right now to forgive you and take that away right now. Come on. It's a very personal thing. I'll lead you through a prayer, but it is a very individual thing. It's very personal. And you've got to uproot that, that bitterness, that old thing, man, that dried up thing that, that's been uh, totally absorbed. It's, it's absorbed your, into your heart and mind where you're, you're living on replay. God wants to bring healing right now all over this place. Come on, just begin to ask the Lord. Lord, bring healing and wholeness. I release that thing. Get that bitter root out of my spirit right now. Come on, just begin to ask him right now. In your own words, God, release me from that bitter root. Lord, help me to have the transformation, the renewing of my mind, as Romans chapter 12 says, that I might release that thing to you. No longer holding it against that person, but releasing it to you. God, take every hurt take every wound I want you to see Jesus there at the cross and I want you to see yourself just setting that hurt down at the foot of Jesus and the Bible says that the, every drop of blood that was spilled on Calvary's cross that the blood of Jesus has power and I want you to see the blood of Christ just covering over that hurt that you've placed at the foot of the cross that it's covered now it's forgiven it's healed that the brokenness is now being being mended that today the wounds are being healed if we're going to live with healthy habits we got to begin and end with forgiveness 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for releasing people right now. Thank you, Lord. I pray we would never pick it back up again. I pray we would look down at the foot of the cross and remember, nope, I don't pick that up again. It's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you take care of it. God, you take care of it. It's no longer my problem. Now, Lord, I just pray in this room that those who may have walked away from you, maybe the the hurts from the past have allowed them to stray from you or give them reason to just doubt who you are. But God, you haven't changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your healing is true. Your blood is powerful. Your forgiveness is real. And I pray in this room right now, we would receive your forgiveness. Those of you that you say, Mark, I need a fresh start, whatever it might be. If it's a transformation, if it's a second start, a third start, if, if it's a first time walking with Jesus to make a willful decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, or if it's a recommitment to laying down the past and living for Christ today for the future and for, for eternity. If that's you, whatever category you fit in, I'm not em- gonna embarrass you, but I want you to raise up your hand acknowledging before heaven that's you. And by raising your hand, you're acknowledging, Lord Jesus, I wanna be part of this healing moment. If that's you, lift up your hands all over this place. Yes, God bless you, God bless you. Yes, God bless you in the back, in the balcony. So many hands lifted. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yeah, God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. Anybody else? This is the healing of hidden hurts right here. God bless you. Anybody else? Yeah. Friends, so many hands lifted. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want to lead it, but I want you to repeat it. And I want you to say it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to say it out loud. Everybody in the room, say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I repent for everything I've done wrong. I believe that you died and rose again for me. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for changing me. I choose to trust you with every area of my life. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you stand up with me? Put your hands together and celebrate all over this house the healing power and presence of God. Come on. Let's worship God together. Is the highest your name? Is the greatest your name? says that we need to strive toward holiness to be more like him in everything we say everything we do our attitudes our actions our behavior this week I want you to talk I want to tell you about temptation the temptation is this to pick this thing up again and to put it right here it's gonna block your view it's gonna block your sight it's gonna block your ability to be, to, to really get things right between you and other people And when you feel that temptation, because somebody's going to tick you off this week, I promise. Matter of fact, just because you heard this sermon, you're going to have temptation. I promise. Sorry I had to tell you that, but to whom much is given, much is required. And as soon as you feel that temptation, I want you to turn this thing around and remember, this is our cross to bear. We're going to be holy as he is holy. 
I want to pray a blessing over you. Before I do, I'm going to release some of our pastors and leaders. They're going to head out the doors to greet those of you uh, who may be just here for the very first time. They're going to go to the guest reception. And I encourage you, if you're a first-time guest in the house or you haven't been back to our guest reception, we'd be honored to greet you and give you a gift for hanging out with us today. Thank you for being here. I want to pray over you a prayer of blessing that you might recognize the goodness of God and focus on the goodness of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and bring you peace. And may the Lord our God write his name on your heart and declare you're my child. No one can take you from my hand. May you know the love of your Savior that came and died for you and rescued you. And may you give that love and that forgiveness away to as many people as humanly possible. I bless you to not be offended, but to live in a state of holiness. I bless you to love God and to love people. And as you do, I bless you to release all roots of bitterness that you might be free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you shout amen? Come on, give God praise one more time. We love you. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled week. We'll see you either this Wednesday or next Sunday. God bless you. You're dismissed.